But first I want to respond to the beautiful words and music of the lone wild bird. The music is Walker's Southern Harmony and it is haunting and soothing soul music. The words of the first verse go like this. The lone wild bird in lofty flight is still with you, nor leaves your sight, and I am yours. I rest in you. Great Spirit, come and rest in me too. Anne Porter was an American poet who did not publish her first poetry until she was about 82 years of age. And she writes of the ability of music to bring the kingdom into the hearts of the earthly bound. This is a portion of her poem, Music, and my response to the beauty in The Lone Wild Bird. Why is it that music, at its most beautiful, opens a wound in us, an ache, a desolation, deep as a homesickness for some far off and half forgotten country? I've never understood why this is so. But there's an ancient legend from the other side of the world that gives away the secret of this mysterious sorrow. For centuries on centuries we have been wondering, but we are made for paradise as deer for the forest. And when music comes to us with its heavenly beauty, it brings us desolation. For when we hear it, we half remember that lost native country. We dimly remember the fields, their fragrant windswept clover, the bird songs in the orchard, the wild white violets in the moss by the transparent streams. And shining at the heart of it is the longed for beauty of the one who waits for us, who will always wait for us in those radiant meadows, yet also came to live with us and wanders where we wonder. This story in John of Thomas is so important for us today. Let me start by saying that I simply love Thomas. He encourages me, gives me strength to voice my own doubts and fears. He's unapologetic in his need, his passion to know, his insistence that he needs to come to faith in his own way. An unapologetic saint of the early church, fiercely loyal to Jesus, uncowed by peer pressure, desperate to experience the full humanity and charisma of the risen one. Remember that the week before, to some of his disciples behind closed doors, Jesus breathed the Spirit on those gathered so that they could be sent out as he had been sent out into the world. And so we come to that part of the scripture that has condemned Thomas to notoriety. I remember many Sunday school teachers admonishing us not to be like Thomas, not to be a doubter, an unbeliever. The older I get, the more I understand and love Thomas and his guts and his passion, his intense desire to experience the resurrection on his own terms. And Jesus tender response to him. Jesus coming into another room where disciples waited, but no one was waiting with more anticipation than Thomas. Jesus says, Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief, Thomas. Believe. In John, we see that Thomas's encounter with his doubts and the scars and the wounds of Jesus, combined with his love for Jesus, led him to a faith that was increasingly strong and mature. More like being on a lifelong journey than to have arrived at a definitive truth. It's a more honest reflection of faith, I believe. To be a person of the way, as the early uh, Christians referred to their faith, is not actually a destination, but it is a road to walk. It is an invitation to the journey that ends not in death, but in life. 
the poignancy and power and vulnerability of Thomas moving his fingers across Jesus' body is simply breath-stopping, raw and real and just so incredibly moving. Today we live in a period when some forms of Christianity have sided, it seems, totally with the brutal cruelty of the powerful against the poor, the alien, the dark, the broken, the homeless, the orphan, the refugee. It is a shameful time. They and even we seem to have forgotten that Jesus spoke truth and love and wisdom out of flesh broken, a heart scarred, and a body exhausted, making him like so many on this earth, a raw, human, broken Christ. Christ in league with the dispirited, the despised, the forgotten, and the enslaved. Without scars and brokenness, Easter is an empty promise. The light shines in the darkness and the light calls us to hope. Over and over again, the story brings us to hope and resolve and gratitude and acceptance. But it's something we do constantly on our life's journey, on the way that we follow. And, of course, there is the Spirit who walks with us, ahead and behind and alongside. God's Spirit to remind us that in pain and despair there is hope and accompaniment. And in times of great joy there is gratitude and insight and peace and an understanding of the brokenness. I want to end with a few poems that have been helping me as I have gone through from that wonderful, um, glorious Easter period from last week through into this first Sunday after Easter when we are suddenly grounded in the reality and the truth of the world that surrounds us. I want to read another poem by Ann Porter, and it's called Susanna. Nobody in the hospital could tell the age of the old woman who was called Susanna. I knew she spoke some English and that she was an immigrant out of a little country trampled by armies. Because she had no visitors, I would stop by to see her, but she was always sleeping. All I could do was to get out her comb and carefully untangle the tangles in her hair. One day I was beside her when she woke up, opening small dark eyes of a surprising clearness. She looked at me and said, you want to know the truth? I answered yes. She said, it's something that my mother told me. There's not a single inch of our whole body that the Lord does not love. And then she went back to sleep. And this poem by Alan Nowlin, Great Things Have Happened, a great maritime poet who grew up in extreme East Coast poverty was befriended by a librarian that introduced him to poetry and to great literature. He always wrote from the heart and off the very ordinary wonders of our lives. We were talking about the great things that have happened in our lifetimes. And I said, oh, I suppose the moon landing was the greatest thing that has happened in my time. But of course, we were all lying. The truth is the moon landing didn't mean one-tenth as much to me as one night in 1963 when we lived in a three-room flat in what once had been the mansion of some Victorian merchant prince. Our kitchen had been a clothes closet, I am sure, on a street where by now nobody lived who could afford to live anywhere else. 
That night, the three of us, Claudine, Johnny, and me, woke up at half past four in the morning and ate cinnamon toast together. Is that all, I hear somebody ask? Oh, but we were silly with sleepiness. And under our windows, the street cleaners were working their machines and conversing in Italian, and everything was strange and without being threatening. Even the tea kettle whistled differently than in the daytime. It was like the feeling you get sometimes in a country you've never visited before, when the bread doesn't taste quite the same, the butter is a small adventure, and they put paprika on the table instead of pepper, except that there was nobody in this country except the three of us, half tipsy with the wonder of being alive and wholly enveloped in love. And this poem called Light Catching by Alison Swinfin, who is a Scottish poet and associated with the Iona community. Let us go light catching. There are places where there are great shafts of it and nets lie idle waiting for the catchers to come. Let us go light catching. Let us cease our angry wrestling with angels and demons for a while and watch it play in these places, though and long. Let us go light catching cabbage white, meadow blue, and let us be bright as the light flutters by. For the time for light harvest is come, and good work needs tortoise shell and painted ladies. And I'm going to end with these words from the risen Christ, from the hymn that my partner, Nigel Weaver, uh, wrote many years ago. The risen Christ who walks on wounded feet from garden tomb through darkened city street, unlocks the door of grief, despair, and fear, and speaks a word of peace to all who hear. The risen Christ who stands with wounded side, breathes out his spirit on them to abide, whose faith still wavers, who dare not believe. New grace, new strength, new purpose they receive. The risen Christ who breaks with wounded hand the bread for those who fail to understand, refills himself despite their lingering tears, inflames their hearts, then quickly disappears. May we, Christ's body, walk and serve and stand with the oppressed in this and every land, till all are blessed and can a blessing be restored in Christ to true humanity. Amen.